It's Halloween night in the year 2000, and a Boeing 747 crawls onto the runway at Taiwan. Amid howling winds and piercing rain, the pilots strain to see out their windscreens. As they push their four massive engines to take off thrust, they have no idea that just ahead of them, a terrifying surprise awaits. This is the horrifying story of Singapore Airlines Flight 6. October 31st, 2000. It's Halloween night in Taipei, and the weather was fitting. Typhoon Zhang Zan was fast approaching, and already its outer reaches were beginning to batter the airport. Winds as high as 100 km per hour buffeted the aircraft on the tarmac as heavy rain pelted the terminal. But safely on board a Boeing 747 operated by Singapore Airlines, 159 passengers from 20 different countries settled in for what was expected to be an uneventful overnight flight. Despite the variety of nationalities on board, most of the passengers were from the United States and Taiwan. 77 of them had actually boarded the aircraft hours earlier in Singapore, while the other 82 had just boarded in Taipei, along with the flight crew. That flight crew consisted of three well-rested pilots, who had arrived in Taipei 24 hours previously. The captain, Fung Chi Kong, was a Malaysian national, and at 41 years of age, he had over 11,000 flying hours to his name. He had been repeatedly assessed by the airline to be an above-average pilot, with colleagues describing him as one of the better pilots at Singapore Airlines. He had also been described as a friendly and approachable person off-duty. The only nick in his record was that 13 years previously, he had done a bit of a noisy departure out of Zurich in Switzerland, and received a letter from the airline asking him to stick more rigidly to the noise abatement procedure there. Not the worst of crimes, although with the wind howling like it was on this night, noise shouldn't be a problem. The first officer was 36-year-old Singaporean Latif Sirano. Sirano was much less experienced than the captain, with about 2,500 hours of total flying time, 500 of which were on the 747. Colleagues had described him as above average, disciplined, and not hesitant to speak out if he saw safety issues on a flight. Sitting behind the captain and first officer was another first officer. 38-year-old Singaporean Un Kang Leng would be acting as a relief pilot for this trip taking over from the first officer over the Pacific Ocean. He would have no specific duties up until this point, other than to keep an eye on what the pilots were doing. He was described as mature and disciplined, with good flying skills, and the potential to become a captain in due course. It's worth pointing out here that Singapore Airlines had an excellent safety record. Its crews were well trained, it had a fleet of state-of-the-art aircraft, and in its 28 years of operation, it had never had a single fatal accident. So, at 5 past 11 local time, when the plane pushed back from gate B5 at Taipei, the 159 passengers had little reason for concern. They had no idea that far from setting out on a 12-hour flight, their aircraft would never even make it off the ground. Picture the scenario. It's late at night, the weather is poor, and it's getting worse as a typhoon is fast approaching. The pilots have a plane load of people eager to get to their destination. If you watched a few of my videos, you'll immediately have a sense of what's about to happen. Under time pressure, and rushing to get airborne before the storm hits, the pilots begin to make mistakes. But this is not the story which is about to unfold. From the get-go, the captain set the opposite tone in the cockpit. What's so strange about what is about to happen is the sheer mismatch between the pilot's level of caution and the terrifying situation they would soon find themselves in. As the most experienced member of the flight crew, the captain elected to taxi the aircraft out to the runway. He would be performing the takeoff and departure out of Taipei. As he taxied out, he emphasized the need to do things slowly and methodically. The first officer's duty, as the plane rolled sedately out to the runway, was to work through the checklists and assist the captain in preparing the aircraft for takeoff. He set the flaps to 20 degrees and the captain confirmed the takeoff speeds. The plane would be lifting off the runway at a speed of 156 knots, or about 290 km per hour. To put this speed into perspective, the wind itself on this night was gusting to one third of the takeoff speed of the plane, about 100 km per hour. As the two pilots carried out their duties, the relief pilot listened in to the ATIS, which stands for Automatic Terminal Information Service, 
This is the service provided at all major airports, which pilots can tune into to find out the latest weather at the airport. It was a daunting weather report, right on the verge of being too much to take off in. There was less than 500 meters of visibility, and the winds were gusting to almost 100 kilometers per hour, rocking the plane as it slowly creeped its way through the darkness. Some of the passengers were getting nervous. If these were the conditions on the ground, what would it be like in the air? But in the cockpit, things were very much under control. The captain's attitude was clear. Right now, the winds and visibility were within safe limits for takeoff. If they stayed that way, the plane would depart, and if they got worse, the plane would simply turn around and go back to the gate. No rush and no pressure. This attitude had served him well in his decades of flying, and it had contributed to Singapore Airlines' excellent safety record. If you want to understand what's about to happen, you need to look at this chart. This is an exact copy of the charts the pilots were using on the night. When air traffic control told the pilots to taxi, this is the route they told them to take. Along the Sierras, up the West Cross, left down November Papa, and then up this way to take off on runway 05 left. In the cockpit, when air traffic control had given the pilots their taxi route, the captain went through it with the other two pilots, so that they would all be, so to speak, on the same page. But while it was a straightforward route, the pilots had to be a bit more careful than usual. It had been more than three years since any of them had taken off from this runway. They were much more familiar with runway 6, here, at the south end of the airport. So, as Flight 6 neared the West Cross, the captain confirmed with his colleagues that this turn was the one he needed to make. And, once this was confirmed, he slowly began turning the aircraft to the right using the tiller. He said that he was going to go very slowly, so as not to skid the aircraft in the turn. The last thing he wanted was to skid his $200 million plane into the mud. The relief pilot, from his position behind the pilots, could easily see both of their primary flight displays. He could see that the winds were so strong that they were being picked up by the pitot tubes on the fuselage of the plane, and then represented as changes in airspeed on the pilot's airspeed tapes. With the wind hitting the aircraft from the right-hand side, the captain's instrument and the first officer's instrument were showing different readings of airspeed. It was a peculiarity more than anything else, indicative of the sheer strength of the wind on this night. As the pilots peered out their windscreens through the rain, they heard some good news over the radio. The runway visual range, which is the distance pilots can see along the runway, had gone up from 200 meters earlier to 450 meters. At least for the moment, conditions were improving. It was beginning to look like they would indeed be taking off when they got to the runway. But still, cautious as ever, the captain continued taxiing slowly at just about nine knots or 17 kilometers per hour. In a few short minutes, they would reach the runway. While it was looking increasingly likely that the weather would hold up long enough for them to take off, another problem now reared its head. What if they took off, but then, for some reason, needed to go back to the airport, only for it to have closed due to the weather worsening after they had departed? Previously, they had agreed that if this happened, they could go to Hong Kong or Kaohsiung instead. But both of these had now been closed, as the typhoon made its way north. With the storm closing in, their only option was now Taipei. The pilots were hoping that it would remain a viable option as they neared the runway. Despite the conditions, the pilots were calm and methodical as they discussed the issue. There was no sense of haste or pressure. After a few minutes, the plane had reached the end of the West Cross. The first officer, looking at his taxi chart, confirmed with the captain that he needed to turn left onto the November Papa taxiway, then go all the way down the end. Once there, they would be at the runway. The captain twisted the tiller counterclockwise, and the 747 lumbered left onto taxiway November Papa. Let's have a look at the chart the pilots were using on this night. At this time, Taipei's airport was undergoing a significant change. Runway 05 right at the time was in the process of being converted into a taxiway. The reason for this is that it was too short and too narrow to be of much use anymore given the sheer size of many of the aircraft which now flew into the airport. It would be much more useful as a taxiway 
which would run parallel to runway 05 left, the airport's longest runway. We'll see why this is so important in a moment. If you've looked out the window of a plane while at the airport, you'll be familiar with all the different coloured lights around the place. There's green taxiway centreline lights, blue edge lights, white runway lights, and red approach lights. The colour and positioning of these lights is completely intentional, and it's standardised across the world. There are also markings which can only be found on runways, like these white stripes here, known as piano keys, which signify the start of a runway. But what do you do, as an airport, when you're converting a runway into a taxiway? What you're supposed to do is to change all of the markings and lighting so that they are suitable for a taxiway. But at Taipei, this hadn't happened. And so, on Halloween night in the year 2000, as the pilots of Singapore Airlines Flight 6 approached the end of taxiway November Papa, they began to fall prey to a series of psychological and systemic errors which would put them in grave danger. It started at 15 minutes past 11, when the tower controller cleared Flight 6 to line up on the runway. The first officer told the cabin crew to take their seats for takeoff, and he began to read out the before takeoff checklist. As he had his head down in the checklist, the captain was peering through the blackness out the windscreen, carefully following the green lights as they beckoned him onto the runway. He again told his colleagues that he would go slowly as he turned. The white piano keys would be slippery. The controller couldn't see the aircraft through the heavy rain, and he also didn't have ground radar to see its position. If he had, he would have seen that Flight 6 was not lining up on runway 05 left, as he'd instructed them to do, but rather onto runway 05 right. The captain was following the green taxiway lights, which were far closer together in the turn than on the straight path leading up to runway 05 left. In fact, there were only four lights in the 200 meter long section of taxiway connecting runway 05 right and left. Legally, there should have been 16 lights, and as if that wasn't bad enough, one of those four lights wasn't working, and another was unacceptably dim. In other words, as the captain followed the green lights curving onto runway 05 right, there was very little to tell him that to his left, there was another runway lying in the darkness. As the plane lumbered into position, the first officer commented that the PVD had not unshuttered. The PVD, or paravisual display, is a unique device installed on the glare shield of some aircraft whose purpose it is to give pilots a visual indication of whether they are drifting off the runway centerline during low visibility takeoffs. There was a shutter in front of it most of the time, but when the aircraft detected that it was lining up on the runway, it unshuttered, revealing the barber pole-like PVD. It struck the pilots as odd that this had stayed shuttered after they lined up on the runway. Of course, the reason it had was that they had tuned their navigation radios to the frequency for the runway they were supposed to line up on, runway 05 left. They were now over 200 meters from that runway, sitting comfortably on what was now becoming a taxiway. What's more, the pilots knew that runway 05 right was being turned into a taxiway. But in the darkness, and lured in by the green lights, they simply never questioned whether they were in the correct place. What's more, as they sat poised on the threshold, bright green centerline lights extended into the darkness. That these lights were green instead of white, like normal runway lights, should have given the pilots a clue that they were on a taxiway instead of a runway. But they had already made up their minds that this was the right place. Besides, these lights had been green for the runway's entire history, because it had actually originally been a taxiway. Ironically, if the visibility had been worse, the pilots would have been safer. They needed to use the power visual display to take off when visibility was lower than 50 meters. But on this night, they could see 500 meters in front of them. That's why, as they lined up, the captain told his colleagues that it didn't matter about the PVD, because they could see the runway anyway. So, at 16 minutes past 11, the captain put the windscreen wipers on high, switched on the landing lights, and pushed the engines to take off thrust. The engines roared, and the massive aircraft began accelerating down the runway into the darkness. As far as the 159 passengers were concerned, they were now well on their way to Los Angeles. Within a few seconds, Flight 6 was accelerating through 80 knots, about 150 kilometers per hour, 
the pilots peered through the void ahead of them as more runway came into view through the fog. But moments later, just as they were about to reach takeoff speed, the terrible truth emerged out of the darkness. Sitting right in the middle of the runway, lit up by the aircraft's powerful lights, were bulldozers, excavators, two rollers, and rows of concrete barriers. The captain shouted out, but it was too late. Travelling at 150 knots, or about 280 kilometers per hour, the 747 smashed through the concrete barricades and then tore through the construction vehicles. Part of the left wing was ripped off, along with three of the aircraft's engines, sending the plane swerving to the left. The fuel tanks ruptured and a huge fireball ignited, enveloping the plane, which split into three pieces and then began tumbling down the runway. In a matter of seconds, it was all over. The tower controller saw the massive fireball tearing through the darkness and immediately dispatched the airport fire service. Over 400 responders rushed to the scene. They were there within three minutes, but for many on board, it was already too late. These pictures, taken the day after the accident, show the extent of the carnage. Of the 179 people on board, only 96 survived, including the three pilots. It was the first and only fatal accident in Singapore Airlines history, and the first fatal accident ever involving a Boeing 747-400. But the same question was on everyone's mind. How had an experienced crew made such a basic error? In the light of day, the sheer senselessness of the mistake became even more apparent, with the correct runway being so clearly in view beside the crashed aircraft. This was exactly what investigators focused on when they began their work immediately after the crash. They found that the pilots were misled by the lighting on the runway, especially considering that their home base was Singapore, where controllers changed the colour of the taxiway lighting in front of the pilots to guide them to the runway, instructing them to follow the green. So, on flight 6, despite the pilots caution about the weather, when it came to navigating to the runway, they reverted to their usual routine of simply following the green lighting to the runway. It didn't help that the closed runway still had its runway markings and bright centerline lights, despite not being in use. All of this meant that when the pilots turned onto the runway, they subconsciously ignored all of the information telling them that they were not where they were supposed to be. The unshuttered PVD, the off-center ILS deviation scale, and the green centerline lighting they became victims of the same psychological bias that has taken so many lives in aviation over the years. Confirmation bias. The tendency to interpret new evidence as confirmation of one's existing beliefs. In this case, there was just enough information telling the pilots that they were in the right place for them to ignore all of the evidence to the contrary. But how do we improve aviation safety when it's vulnerable to such basic flaws in human cognition? Partly as a result of this accident, many modern aircraft like the newest generation Boeing 747, the Airbus A350, and the Boeing 787 among others, have moving map displays inside the cockpit where pilots can see their position live as they move through the airport, rather than relying on paper maps and charts. This technology alone would have prevented the crash of Flight 6. Pilots now also receive more training on what's known as threat and error management, which requires that they make a note of the dangers and possible mistakes they may make as, say, they taxi out to the runway. On Flight 6, if the pilots had discussed the possibility that they might mistake runway 05 right for 05 left, this accident may not have taken place. Also, airports now face more stringently enforced regulations when it comes to signage and lighting. These layers of protection, covering everything from human factors to avionics, have made this kind of accident far less likely. But the crash of Singapore Airlines Flight 6 shows just how unforgiving aviation can be, especially in marginal conditions. Hey everyone, hope you found that episode interesting. If you'd like to support the channel, the best way to do that, apart from liking and subscribing on the video, is by joining the Patreon. I put the link to that in the video here, as well as in the description below. So if you feel like you're getting something here that you're not getting elsewhere on YouTube, the best way to support the channel is by signing up on Patreon. Otherwise, I'll see you soon for the next episode.